If you ever want any free gear, just convince Tom to buy something you want and then wait a year. Then you'll get it. That's how you got an Xbox. <laughs> yeah. I bought his Xbox off him for 200 quid. <laughs> I feel like I'm just like, just taking advantage every step of the way of our friendship. Yeah, I saw your list on Facebook, Tom, that you posted about <laughs> things that you're shifting. And I almost commented underneath saying, Please don't bring all of these items on the podcast and do show and tell and try and flog them. The only Fools and Horses episode where Tom's just, anybody want to buy a, an amp? <laughs> Didn't even know what half of it was. I took like 10 of them today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I gave it all away. I didn't take any money from it, for it, and all of it's gone. You owed about 100 pints around Plymouth, though. I probably am, yeah. <laughs> What's up, Bunketeers? Who's up for some more cacophony sessions? I am. <laughs> well, plucky listener slash viewer, you're in luck. Welcome back to season four, episode three of the podcast. And this week we have the return of an old favorite. It's the cacophony sessions goes pop again, in which we brave the often Drake infested waters of the official UK top 40 charts. And we listen to the top 10 of the week commencing the 14th of April, 2023. We've plunged these depths before in 2021 and again in 2022. That time it was overseas in America when we had a look at the Billboard Top 100. Get your towels because we're going back in to report on what's happening in chart music in 2023. My name is Dan Whittle, aka Golden E-Pump. And as usual, I don't make this journey alone. I've got my team of misfits right here with me. So introducing the returning Alex. If you were a flower, you'd be a damn delion. <laughs> Tumble <laughs> <with it. laughs> Dan B. Oof. Hedgehogs, eh? Why can't they just share the hedge? <laughs> Think about and, that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and Tom. If text kisses were real kisses, the world would be an orgy. <laughs> Are you still doing your uh, David Mitchell? Seems yeah. like it. Yeah, yeah I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, lovely. Before we get started, I'll get some plugs in before you'll realise that, hey, this isn't Alan Partridge from the Yoast House, and I'll direct you to the blog at cacophonysessions.wordpress.com, which contains all our playlists, a catalogue of all our undeniable bangers that we've certified since 2020. It contains Tom's listening list that he's always updating, I'm sure and details of how you can join our Patreon. If you weren't already aware, the first part of each episode is uploaded for free on YouTube. And if we doth please your eyes, then you can join our Patreon for just a fiver to get the full length video episode. You really want the full length. <laughs> oh, and this goes on YouTube. Oh, and I, oh, I did remember to take it down my Nazi memorabilia. <laughs> yes, <door> right. <laughs> yes, all clear, all clear. We're also available on Facebook. We're at CAC Sessions Pod on Twitter. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. And do old Golden Pump a favour, will you? Tell a friend about us this week. Even if it is just get a load of these wankers, it does still do a little bit for helping get our name out there. So go on. Do us all a favour. Don't worry, I'm not going to do one of those Manscape adverts now. I haven't completely sold out just yet. Besides, just veat it all at once at the beginning of summer and keep it trimmed when necessary. Apart from the extremities. Never slap veat on your extremities. Speaking of slapping, let's think of a song that does just that. Hit the city jingle. Don't you hate the podcast where the jingles are crap. So let's take a good song and ask does it slap. I had one recently and I, was, I thought it should have been. Just gonna be, sh oh, fuck it. Should we just do an easy one? ACDC, TNT. TNT, yeah. I would also go for Back in Black as well. But I know. I think TNT might be better. We, is there like a, fa a rule on how many songs per artist we have? No, no. there isn't. All right. So just ACDC's I'm going, yes. greatest hits. Oh, 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 yeah. ACDC's greatest hits. No. <laughs> TNT, yeah. Tom hasn't said yes or no so far. Do you not like that song? It's I'm... that part of the podcast where a song that everyone thinks is a classic, Tom goes, oh, we well, can't hang fall on. out this quickly. It is a classic, and so I have to let it in, begrudgingly. I don't like how it's begrudging. Weirdly, 
TNT is the ACDC track I would let in. I find ACDC really difficult. I just, it's not a band I really... It's because it's blues. And I think I've explained... Al knows, as soon as I hear a blues chord, I'm like, nope, <laughs> not interested anymore. And that's most of ACDC. But no, TNT, it's in. Can we get Breaking the Law in by Judas Priest as well? I think everyone knows that song. If we're on a roll, yeah. I could read off like 20 to <laughs> fill the blog in your <laughs> I'm ambivalent at best, to be honest with you. Breaking the Law. <laughs> My favourite ACDC experience, I haven't seen them live, but Al, you were there for this, is when we were in Budapest mm-hmm. and we were on one of those mobile beer bikes. Pedal. A pedal oh, beer right. bike. Driving around the centre of Budapest and we stopped at the traffic lights and this homeless man approaches us and asks us for some money. We declined his offer, but we allowed him a place on the beer bike, which he then shouted. The only English word that he knew was ACDC. <laughs> we were on this beer bike just going full throttle down the hill in Budapest whilst playing Thunderstruck. He then got off of the next set of traffic lights and we never saw him again. We poured him a beer, gave him his ACDC fix and sent him off on his way. So if oh, you're listening, well, Thunderstruck Gary, we hope you had a good day after that. It's a slim chance he will be, but I really hope he is. <laughs> <laughs> You never know. We may not be popular in Hungary, but we did actually chart at number 18 in the Swedish Musical Discussion podcast charts. Fuck off, did we? <laughs> yeah. Oh. For all of you, for what? all of the, the Thanks, six or ben. seven of you that are listening to us in Sweden, I don't know how to say thank you in Swedish, but... I don't know. It's funny you say that. I've been going through Arnold Schwarzenegger films the last couple of days, actually. I'll be I was going to ask what you've been up to. I'll start going then. Our new section, you've been off, so give us the um, lowdown. At work, I've been listening to, for the tenth time, the Arnold Schwarzenegger biography. It's 30 mm. hours long and the most inspirational story of all time. So I've just been going for Arnold Schwarzenegger films the last couple of days. I finished Conan the Barbarian last night, which is still pretty fucking wicked. Which is the one where he fights a bear? Is that Conan or is that Hercules No, no, that's, that's Hercules in New York. But that's I was really, the one. They, the they best record... scene I've ever seen in my life. Well, yeah, because just... they made that. That was when he was still, like, just starting out body like bodybuilding in America, so that was ten yeah. years before Conan, and uh, they actually benched the film, but he only re-released it when he became famous. Mm. And I'm so glad they did. <laughs> it's just a man in a bear costume. It's yeah. amazing. Other than that, just doing band stuff. We're up to five songs now. We have a vocalist lined up, which I'm pretty excited by. Tom will know he was well when you're in a band. They're just riffs you play back to back until you get a singer in and make them songs, you know what I mean? So yeah. I'm quite looking forward to that. I listen to a few albums. I've been listening to a lot of Power Trip. They're kind of like a new wave thrash band. And the yeah. singers, he died a couple of years back, actually, from a fentanyl overdose. He must have been doing something else and he got mixed, but which is pretty sad. But they're a pretty wicked thrash band. If anyone wants to listen to them, I would say my top 10 thrash bands because they are consistently incredible. I you actually to- have. Been, I listen oh, to have. Nightmare Logic. I was just looking at it on my phone. Executioner's Tax, Swing yep. of the Axe. That's yep. a great tune. Oh, mate, they've got some fucking bellies. They understand what makes Thrash good. Something like Metallica have forgotten. It's just <laughs> like what makes Thrash good is just downward stroke, muted, open, and just a little dun 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 in there. Just, but just with a simple drum beat, it just makes everyone just nod their head. And that's a fucking tit. So I've listened to a lot of them recently. I've seen to them before, but I never, I've never made an active decision to listen to them. But I have recently, and yeah, they are incredible. I listened to the new In Flames album. I'm not sure anyone here is an In Flames fan. They were one of the biggest metal bands for me up until about, yeah. I'd say, 2006. I got into Morel Clayman, so 2000 to 2006, they were big In Flames years for me. Big, big years for all music, quite frankly. Yes, probably. <laughs> to be fair, it's knowing our generation. Yeah. It's, other than Whittle, I think we'll all agree. <laughs> but I heard the new album because they went a bit weird and it went a bit like clean vocally and a bit shitty and they went for grander and larger appeal. But I didn't really get a follow along for it because I didn't enjoy it. But I heard rumblings on Facebook just from my feed of people saying the new album before Gone was a return to their old stuff. They're full of shit because it's not. It's got a few pretty good bits on it, but for the most part, it's all right. It's not bad. It's just not my cup of tea. Other than that, I listen to the newest Code in Cambria album, just out of curiosity. I check in on that band every couple of years to see if they've managed to get as good as they were in their first two albums. I mean, in keeping secrets. Come on, yeah. you've got to. I'll save three well. to be generous because it is pretty Thank good. You. But but I remember, I remember listening, loving the first two albums, and the third album came out, and it was going a little 
further away from what I liked about Cody and Cambria, but it's in hindsight, it's still pretty much what I like about Cody and Cambria. But it's got so much better nostalgia. than everything else afterwards. So that's what I've been up to, other than, you know, just. You, you went to a gig, didn't you? Oh, yes. I was there. <laughs> we saw Don Broco in London. I can't remember the exact date now. I can't remember the exact gig either because I was so fucking pissed. <laughs> yeah, we got very drunk. 28th of uh, March, I think. 28th of March, yeah. At the, uh, what was the venue? It's probably the best venue I've been to, actually. It was Alexandra Palace in North London. It was, it was an incredible venue. It's a bit in the middle of... The Alley Pally. Yeah. yeah, the Alley Pally. Not for the darts, but it was a great venue for concert. I thought the acoustics worked. I thought, you go great. outside and you got this landscape view of the centre of London from afar. It's almost it's... like being in the Hollywood Hills. It is fantastic. It's really like, not. Like, you know, honestly, I, I was quite impressed. I had no idea they did gigs in place like that. Yeah, it was, a, it was a great gig. Like, I've always maintained that Don Broke one of the best bands I've ever seen live. This time round, I saw him in Plymouth and I probably enjoyed it more. Not, well, I don't think I enjoyed it more, but this time round, I'm a Devon guy. I like drinking cider. When I go to London, they don't really have cider. So I got on very well with this Bumblebee pear. Oh, like, yeah. The Perry, which was 9%, which I had way too many of before going to the gig. So you're essentially drinking pints of wine before going. I was an absolute mess. The first band on, was it Papa Roach's first band on? No, no, no. no was I was also quite first. drunk because I had to get drunk to endure Dance Gavin Dance. I like Dance Gavin Dance, so it's okay. I like Dance Gavin Dance. Yeah, I thought really they good. were woeful. If you like Dance Gavin Dance, then you will like them live because they sound exactly the same. Yeah, They're flawless live, so fair enough. But, but I really enjoyed that. You know you're a bit too pissed when... The second band comes on and you're that fat guy with his top off in the mosh pit when everyone else around you is literally like borderline sober. Mm -hmm. I remember the end of Don Broken. It got a song called T-Shirt Song and the chorus yeah. is, I take my T-shirt off and swing it around my head. <laughs> so I was swinging my T-shirt around, right? Like I was bell end wasted. But I was clipping the guy to my right's head every time I swung it. And he tells me, he goes, mate, can you stop fucking doing it? I went, oh yeah, sorry, I'll stand about two inches to my left and then start doing it again. <laughs> and he was so fucking livid at me. He's going to find you now. If you're listening, please send us a tweet. We recognise that fellow. <laughs> if it was you, I don't apologise. We were in an open area, you could have just moved. All right, but yeah, absolutely so wasted. I've got a question. Yeah, go for you it. obviously saw them in Plymouth. Yes. What year was that? Because they they've probably changed quite a bit, haven't they? It was their tour for technology, so the album for this one. Um, that was 2018, I think. Yeah, it was a while back now, actually. Yeah, About five years. To be fair, I was absolutely wasted with my top off swing my t shirt when they played at that time as well. That was pretty good. Of course, good. got like a lot bigger in the interim, really, haven't they? So what? Were, were they different? They were pretty much the same. They're because the technology tour is when they started really upping their like stage. Lighting rigs and the all that theatrics, stuff. The theatrics, yeah, they've been yeah. there for a while, but high yeah. budget. They obviously for a while. they upped it during technology, and it was, if not the same, if not better for this one. It looks as it's a show; it does look fantastic. It was really yeah. good. Colourful. He's got a great stage presence. He's yeah. a way better frontman than I previously had given him credit for. A lot of their recorded stuff is quite wacky, and I wasn't sure how it was going to come across on stage. But he carries himself with the kind of swagger that he gets away with it and pulls it off. He's a great singer. Our ongoing joke between uh, me and um, Perfect Dan Taylor, if you want to know him on the podcast, but he listens. Shout, so out. shout out Dan. We have an ongoing joke that he dresses like Tony from Member Hate Me Badly. <laughs> so whenever we're absolutely smashed, we just put us there, like whenever we're seeing him or just after we see him, we're just like literally mincing around going. It's a banging thing. I prefer technology to their newer album, so. I, I don't. You don't. I don't. Uh, I, I think as an album, it goes to weirder places, and I like that. Technology is a really good album, and I really like that. But I think Amazing Things is its like the difference between 8.5 and an 8.8. I feel like technology is a bit closer to rock music, while you can tell the production ramped up a bit too much, you know what I mean? In my opinion, where it sounds a little like, how do they recreate this live? And you go over, like, all the vocals are, like, put in, like, 10 vocal tracks over a chorus, and it's not quite the same... Before they got away of just catching us rather than just big sounding, you know what I mean? Yeah, they've I got the high production. And, yeah. it, it, and it yeah. sounds good. I like the album. I think it was on my, one of my albums of the year last year, wasn't it? Or yeah. it was, the year before. The year before, yeah. So I do like it. It's just a technology. How are Papa Roach? I hadn't seen Papa Roach before, so Owl appears to be representing for the fan club. I actually went into the gig being a bit condescending towards Papa Roach, and I, I thought, they're a band that I think had one kind of 
flash in the pan hit in last resort. And I fail to see how they're going to entertain me beyond the nostalgia of that one track. They were much better than that because, again, it's energy is a big thing. I always talk about energy levels, but it was really good. They lent into the more pop audience that would be there. They played Firestarter, a cover of the Prodigy track, and I thought that was actually quite good at getting the party going it, you, what better song can you pick to come it was when they when they played that i actually le- left the pit in a huff because i i think my exact words to dan was i don't want to watch a fucking cover band but <laughs> but as i said i was obnoxiously wasted at the time so it's fine <laughs> the, the only issue with papa Ridge is they infest is a genuinely great album you may not like new metal weather but it's good then the one after is okay they had a few good songs and then after that it's been fucking shit and i feel like they know it because live, I've seen them a few times, they only play like one or two newer songs. They play like Getting Away with Murder one, because it might have been like a Need to Speed Underground soundtrack back in the day. But it's like they know their new stuff isn't very good, because no one's fucking buying it. Yeah. Since their second album. They're known to be really good live, but they don't make very good songs. Yeah. But the good thing is, you can literally span 20 years of a career on that, so yeah. they do all right. So everyone sees them live, but actually they're pretty good. At least they didn't pull a Wheatus, because... They only played Last Resort once, and <laughs> the last time I heard someone attended a Wheatus concert, I believe they played Teenage Dirtbag seven times. So that's one way you can be hammer some, your hit home. You have to be some sort of asshole to see Wheatus live. I don't know. You have to be, you have to be, <laughs> you have to some, be in Wheatus. You have to be some <laughs> level of idiot to go see Wheatus live. Like, really? <laughs> What's the opposite of does it slap? Because the <laughs> Teenage Dirtbag needs to go in the vault or something. It's the worst earworm ever. My, girl, I, my girlfriend just loves you it. Just you talking about it, it's, it's now no gone problem. in my head and it's not going to get out for days. Does it blow? Does it make me want to pull my intestines out of my arse? Yeah, it's disgustingly bad. I'll get on the jingle for that, but I'm not sure it'll be as catchy. It is a catchy song, though. I will give it that. That's partly why I hate it. Sorry, yeah. you want to ask me what I've been up to? It won't surprise you to know that I've not done anything musical in any way whatsoever. However, was... I did go to Wembley, which was also something that I probably shouldn't talk about, mm-hmm. being that. This is the third time I've been to Wembley now, second time in the new, newer stadium. For the younger generation listening to us, I'm sure there's thousands of you. There was previously another Wembley stadium in the same place. That was much better because Plymouth Argyle actually won a match there. We should probably clarify to people who don't actually know us that you're a Plymouth Argyle fan and we live in Plymouth and they were in the playoffs. We're well, not playoffs, say the, um, was it what cup final was? They were the in cup the final. pizza <laughs> trophy, the e Papa John's <laughs> trophy or the EFL <laughs> trophy, which is for League One and League Two teams. We've got to go to Wembley. It's a really exciting day, fun time. 2 0 down within 10 minutes and lose 4 0. I, I was on Sky Sports at Claire's mum's house. We wanted to watch it. And I was there on, on Sky Telly trying to figure out how to just get the games. So you get like a day pass, like a tenner or something. Mm-hmm. And by the time I figured it out, they were 2 0 down and we thought, ah, oh, fuck it. <laughs> That's you made the right the decision because it was that mm-hmm. great. So congratulations to Bolton. But in better news, we, because, you know, I'm. I am playing, because that's what we, we do. Oh, <laughs> top of the league. We are top of the league. No we wonder you lost if you were playing. Yeah, if I was playing, we'd be losing 57 nil. It's not more. <laughs> we'd be Exeter yesterday, which is the Devon Derby, to move it's back dumb. top of the league again. Yeah, six toes and all that. Sorry to our <laughs> Exeter listeners up there. Do you know, it still bothers me that Exeter, living in Exeter is the capital of Devon. That still bothers me. I found out on Wikipedia like a year ago, and to this day, I'm like, why is it the capital? Like we've got like three times their population. Fuck them. It's got because we're like our it. own unitary authority. We don't need to be the capital. We're our own thing. The M5 stops at Exeter. The Romans didn't get any further. But that's not true. The Romans because did we... get further. That's just a ru- that was a lie that history teachers told us. They built anyway, the worst anyway, in my house. Before we turn this into a history podcast. <laughs> Plymouth is actually the capital of Montserrat. So there you go. You can claim that. Exeter can't claim that. It may have been buried under volcanic ash, and it's an area that's actually inhospitable to man, but it's still the capital. Are they still bottom of the FIFA World Rankings? I'm not sure, but I don't think they've won many games, especially if it's all buried under volcanic ash. Still better than our goals. Just like being an extra <laughs> Tom. <laughs> Tom, what have you been doing? It's a shame that Martin's not here, because he plugged no, this not. so much... Oh, yeah, probably is. <laughs> he plugged this so much better than me. So, as... Long-time listeners will know, I've been in a band. We've had to rename because someone else had the same name as us. So we're now called Foreign Voices. Our EP is coming out on the 5th of May. We recorded down at Cube Studios in Cornwall. Shout out to those guys. It's a fantastic place. 
it's in the absolute middle of nowhere, but it's a fantastic place. Yes, we've got a three-track EP coming to Spotify and all the other services. If this episode's going to be out before the 5th of May, I'll allow Dan to stick a preview of one of the tracks on the end of the episode, maybe. Yeah, we'll happily run that. Excitingly, we had our first track on BBC Introducing. You can listen to it. BBC Introducing, BBC Radio, Devon, Somerset and Cornwall. The track's called Daughter. But if you search it on BBC Sounds, it's on there. We're an hour and 39 minutes into the episode. And it's the one with Devia. It's end of March, 28th of March, I think. They picked probably our weakest of the three tracks to put on. But I say that I think Daughter's the weakest of the three tracks. It's still great. I still love it. But I think the other two that we've got are better, but they're also a lot longer. Of course you're in a band where you don't like your first single. That is the most Tom thing to do. <laughs> I don't dislike our first single. Let's right, make this okay. very clear. I don't dislike the first <laughs> single. For the best. But the B and the C side, I think, are stronger than the single. But they're six mi- both six minutes long, so I can imagine why they didn't get played on radio as a band that no one's heard of. Yeah, so hopefully that we'll get that out and gigging. Listening to new stuff. As well, I'll save everything for a CAC news because it's loads, but people want to hear us rip the top 10 to pieces, don't they? That is yeah. true. That is true. <laughs> but and first, we've term- got to hear what you've been up to. Yeah, what have you been up to? <laughs> I will keep the new releases to a CAC news. I've listened to quite a lot. The only one that I'm going to mention in this episode is I have listened to the new Metallica album, 72 Seasons. It's presumably called that because it's been 72 seasons since everyone worked out that Metallica are hacks. The game's up. It's too long. It's the be here now of metal. Every song's too long. But if you did make an album of the first 90 seconds of each track, it'd probably be all right. There's a couple of good songs on there. It's not all terrible, but it just goes on way too long and says nothing. So I'm not a big fan of that Metallica album. There have been a lot of good releases, though, this year. And outside of the pop charts, there's been some wonderful albums that we will go and cover on a Cat News episode. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and then we will be able to provide you updates on our thoughts on the releases of the year so far, because there's been quite a few. I did go to a gig, as well as the Don Broco gig with Al. I actually went to another one I saw in Plymouth for once, was The Far Side. They were playing at The Depot, which is a an up-and-coming music venue down here. A lot of live acts are choosing to come and play at The Depot, so it seems to be booming, which is good. The Far Side, we covered them briefly, Tom. The Bizarre Ride to The Far Side was one of your favourite albums, if not your favourite album of the early 90s in terms of hip-hop. Lab Cabin California is my favourite of their releases. That's produced by Jay Diller, though, so that's why I like yeah. their later stuff. They were really good yeah. live, and it wasn't the full lineup. so we had Fat Lip, he's a great MC, and you had Slim Kid 3 and Imani. Legally, they're now the far side with an F, the far side libs, because Booty Brown, the other member, is in legal proceedings against them, and he's trying to claim ownership of the far side PH name. It seems a little bit messy, and obviously they're missing him from their lineup because having done tracks with Gorillaz, etc., his name's probably a little bit higher up in the hip-hop pecking order than theirs. So it does seem a little bit petty, but they still rock the house live. And they were supported by the Scribes, and the Scribes are a local hip-hop. Act. They've been going for about the best part of 10 years now, and they're always entertaining. Sean, a.k.a. Illiterate, does a freestyle rap when people hold up objects in the crowd, he can freestyle and cover the whole span of the crowd during that. It's always impressive to see. I like those guys. I do know them. And hopefully we'll be talking to Sean and the rest of the guys at some point because they're playing Glastonbury. So I'd like to get their thoughts on the festival and their experiences there. So stand by for that. That'll be on the YouTube channel. Also, I'm looking to do a bonus episode with Plymouth Argham Rugby Football Club. We've been the seasonal sponsor for William Lloyd and they've had a good season and they're in a cup final. You may have noticed that the Cacophony Sessions logo has been green this year. It's not in reference to Plymouth Argyle, it's actually Plymouth Argham, the rugby team. We've been sponsoring them and I'd like to get their thoughts. So stay tuned for some shenanigans in the pipeline that we're working on. And that's pretty much it for the news. Make sure you check out the Cacophony Sessions wherever you can, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, the blog, etc. Now we've got our task at hand, and that is to slaughter the top ten, to take them to task and to really give them a good grill in till they feel a little bit ashamed of themselves. Or maybe they've done some good stuff. Let's find out. <laughs> Top 
10 from the 14th of April 2023. And in at 10, down two places from last week, it's the song Creepin' by St. Louis producer Metro Boomin, and it features Canadian singer The Weeknd and Atlanta rapper 21 Savage. Released in late December, it's a cover, nay, a remake, according to Wikipedia, of Mario Winans' 2004 hit, I Don't Wanna Know, and it actually features Winans returning on backing vocals alongside Travis Scott. So what do we think of this? This is the most unoriginal song that has ever been made. This really annoys me because you've got the synth riff. I heard the synth riff at the beginning and I went, I recognise that. And it's from Ready or Not by the Fugees, which is actually in itself a cover of Bodicea Enya. by Enya. Mm-hmm. So this is a cover of, this is a remake, basically a cover of yeah. Mario Winans, mm-hmm. who was covering Ready or Not by the Fugees, mm-hmm. who were sampling Bodicea by Enya. Yeah. That's literally the least original <laughs> track that has ever been made by anyone. The songwriting ever, right? credits are a mess. An <laughs> absolute mess. Because I remember when the Fuji sampled Bodicea, they initially yeah. got into a lot of trouble because they did it without permission. And she had to be added on as a songwriter. And now they've gone ahead and covered the cover of that song. Why go to all that unnecessary drama to call a mid-song? Ready or Not by the Fugees is a banger, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, undeniable. That is a, yeah, it yeah. is an undeniable Shall banger. Shall we have it? Yeah. I'll give you that. I do like that song. Don't they have a better song, though? Oh, they've done lots of Killing songs. Me Softly. Fuji La. I feel like that's their not their cover No Woman, No Cry is good as well. I feel like the one, that one there is like, that epitomizes 90s music for me. You know, when you're like a kid in school discos, that's the one I always think of. I do remember pretending to die to Killing Me Softly several times. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a fair point. Yeah, are they? I mean, yeah, like, why not? Like, Kill me so-. The thing I remember about that song is I always liked the token verse from Praz at the end of Ready or Not because it's Wyclef and Lauren Hill, and then you get four lines from Praz and that seems to be a theme across the album he was only given a very limited amount of limelight within the group but then had maybe the biggest solo hit with Ghetto Superstar so interesting I think it's interesting that you're talking about that because this song is so forgettable that you don't want to talk about this current song that's the real point of everything you've just said is how pointless and unnecessary this current song is it's just terrible the 2004 song wasn't great no. And this takes it to another level of turd. <laughs> I can't believe that The Weeknd managed to sound worse than Mario Winans. Yeah, I like The Weeknd. He's done some So really do I, stuff. but this and isn't it. <laughs> yeah, it's really not. There's none of that atmospheric build-up with this. He just sings a carbon copy of the original. I will give some credit, though. The 21 Savage verse, it's the best part of the song. I'm not a big fan of his, but it was still right. Yeah, I thought it was... It was at least different, I suppose. It took the song to a place that didn't exist before in the, origi- in the original... Not, it's hard to call it the original version, because it's really not. Okay, I'm going to annoy you guys and say this is my second favourite song on the top ten. I think my <laughs> That's exact... That's not saying a lot, though, to be fair. <laughs> no. My notes here are, really liked it, strong chorus and great singing, cool vibes. <laughs> Were you familiar with the Mario Wynan song, though? Probably subconsciously, that's probably why I like this one, I guess. But, <laughs> but I don't see what the problem is. I thought the single was good. I like the kind of not over the top. It's not like going big. It's a bit down, but not. And I don't know. I thought it was really good. I was listening in the car and went to band practice. And I was like, yeah, you know what? This is... I was ready to hate it. I didn't know it was the weekend until you said, said then. I just bung it on my Napster app, and then just give it a go. But I thought it was really good. I don't know what you guys are on about. Like, what's there to be bummed out by by this song? It's not the worst song in the is, world. Is it just one of those ones that, because you know the history behind it, you don't like all the bits that have come together? Or, like... Because yeah. I, I didn't know that. So, for me, it was just a really good song. <laughs> Whoever programmed the drum machine, I loved it. Because when that chorus hit, it was that right level of subtle... I really in, liked it. In my notes, I said, when the drum beat kicks in, it improves the song. But it's just the drums lifted from the Mario... Winans. Song. Well done, Mario. Yeah. I like this one. So I thought it was great. I really should make a playlist of all the songs I listen to on this podcast and make a separate one so I actually listen to them again, which I don't, unfortunately, because I'm a lazy music fan. It's because I remember the original coming out and I know the original. And so when I'm hearing this song, I'm like, that's from this, that's from this, that's from this. And it ruins your enjoyment. I don't think I've ever bought a single or deliberate. So now, I know that this is done from streaming, so it's a bit different now, but I've bought quite a few singles in my time, 
and I'm pretty sure I've never bought a single that was a cover. You might have. But anyway. No, I haven't. I've listened to tracks that are covers, obviously, but I think my other problem is that I still think of the chart as going to HMV and buying a CD or a cassette single. Yeah. And I, I still order singles by bands that I like, mostly on vinyl. And I realise the chart isn't that anymore, but when I'm no. listening to it, I'm still assuming that this is something that we paid that I've paid three pounds for and I wouldn't pay three pounds for this. I don't know, I think I would. What is it like Christian Bale meme where it's like Ooh, like that? That face? Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Like whenever that chorus hits in, every time I still go, Ooh, yeah. Like I I just found that with this song. I just really liked it. <laughs> it's just it's I didn't like, listen yeah, to it, but I see that Diddy himself was on the remix. Did anybody yeah. listen to that? Oh, I didn't no, listen to him. Not. I've never been a fan of Diddy anyway. Even when in his heyday in the 90s, he was always a bit whack compared to a lot of other guys in the hip-hop scene. He seemed like a bit of a coattail rider on Biggie's death. And then, of course, he did yeah, that song that was massive that he's now paying Sting $2,000 every day. Oh, fuck off. His best song's that Hate Me song. That was good. You can hate me. He's got some good songs. But but I, just, <laughs> I never thought he was anything special within hip-hop. He's just really good at making friends. I liked it. It was a good song. It wasn't some ugly guy doing acoustic music, <laughs> which happens to be massive in the UK at the moment. Apparently not being good looking, be able to sing an average song that your mum likes. Apparently is a massive deal for the... <laughs> Bloody hell, you're uh, throwing Lewis Capaldi under the bus, aren't you? <laughs> Fuck me. Like, it drives me nuts. It's not the worst thing in the top 10. I'll draw that line right now. I don't hate it. I've seen so many versions of this exact song before that it just sounds derivative to me. In my head, this is the yeah. best version of it. Maybe we're thinking about music all wrong. Maybe you don't need originality. Maybe you should be like updating a building every couple of years because the grout needs redoing. Maybe like a song that's, we just keep building the same song over the next 30 years until it's a perfect song. Charting at number nine this week. It's a song that's been up and down the charts for 32 weeks, peaking at number three and is now back in the top 10, up from 11th place last week. It's Green Green Grass from 29-year-old English pop folk singer George Ezra. I don't know who he is. When I heard his voice, I just assumed he was some black dude. I didn't, when you yeah. said that, I was just like, really? He's very wow. soulful. <laughs> He's a Rick Astley. Yeah, He's got green, that kind green of voice. Grass. My younger brother was a music college with George Ezra and apparently he's a really nice guy my brother was working with him for a while and my brother said to me this guy I'm working with voice makes girls come and he George some men. Got, yeah maybe he's got a really good voice but this particular track isn't for me I like an uplifting song but when something goes a little bit too far into just a bit too a bit jaunty and a bit too yeah this got there yeah. for me, to be honest. There were three things I really didn't like about this. First is the intro sounds like something out of a really dodgy early 2000s R&B track. Mm. Or a Lil Tad's up. Yeah. <laughs> this it, does it, have Lil Tad yeah, vibes. It does. <laughs> the keyboard stabs in the bridge are ripped off a Steps track, I'm pretty sure. And the lilt he's got on his vocal is exactly the same as, he's, as he does on Shotgun, which is another one of his songs. His first album's really good, and he's got a really nice voice, but this song just pisses me off. Is anyone else having, like, vibes with a lot of these songs that we do on the top ten, where this reminds me of that a song we did, what was it, number one we had a while back? We call it the zombie music one. Oh, my God, oh, my God. Da, 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 da. It's the Ooh, same that fucking... similar, isn't it? Yeah. It's the exact same vibes, different music, different lyrics, so you can't say it's the same song, but it's the same fucking song. Yeah. <laughs> There's a certain vibe that's really hot at the moment, and that, this is yeah. it. And same, I would too far like the last one a bit more actually. Like this one's a bit too cheesy. I prefer yeah. Anyone For You that he released on this album as a single as well. Tiger Lily, it's quite a nice song. This one's a bit more, bo not boring, that's unfair, but a bit safer, I think. And you know it's safe when they allow you to play it at the Queen's Jubilee, which shows how long it's been in the chart. Ah, but and they had they... to take on the day that I die out of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was going to say that... that's irritating the because that I live. the yeah. whole point of this song was that he went to St. Lucia, apparently, and he heard this really upbeat people and they're like, oh, what's going on? What's going on? And they're like, we've got a funeral. And he couldn't believe that you could be this upbeat yeah. at a funeral. But there were three different why funerals at once, apparently. That's the story. It's just the most non-offensive, hipster, liberal wank. And it says absolutely nothing. And it sums it up because he was asked to take the offending line, because it says the word die in it, out of the song at the Jubilee. And he actually obliged. What a wanker. 
how much of an artist are you if you get the mildest pushback from the world's most mollycoddled granny and you're like, oh no, that's a totally reasonable request to do. And do you not know that? They played it at the funeral a month later and they cut all the words in. Uh, that's a ridiculous way of <laughs> thing to say. That's, that's not like true. Saying, why would you censor a song for music videos beyond MTV? Like, he literally censored one word to have his song listened to from the biggest broadcast that year. Why would he do it? He'd be stupid not to. It's not all about money. The music business. Yeah, I know, but I like principled artists. You, we've got a Patreon right now. Yeah, <laughs> but the Monica. content that we put out is principled. I ain't going to go on stage at the King's Coronation and do Does It Slap. Fuck you. If they said you could cover the Queen's Coronation... But Martin's not allowed to be an ex he gets too drunk. You'd totally do that. No, absolutely <laughs> not. They can suck my big, fat, hairy cock, and that will go on record. One, I bet it's <laughs> not that hairy. <laughs> we that was the part you had a problem with. <laughs> Bowie refused knighthood, didn't he? Yeah, exactly, because he was a true artist. I would not be knighted. Not like I'm going to be knighted for services to undeniable bangers, but if oh, they come, come, if oh, they come and knock in... No, 100% not. If you could add Sir Goldie Pump, you totally would. You can buy it. It means the same thing, but I'm not go- I'm not an idiot. I'm not going to spend money on it. I, I don't want to be associated with charlatans, so I'm good. Thank you. If you're happy with being somebody who gets booked to play garden parties because they're better than the sound of the wind, like George Ezra, then fine. But if you but- actually want to have some sort of artistic merit and say something, then turn these dickheads down. It's a pop song. Like, we meet the artistic integrity. He's not making a point of this song. I'm being very cynical of this week's top 10. The last song wasn't made for the right reasons. It was just a reinterpolation of an old song so that they can get some TikTok clicks. And this one feels like it's saying absolutely nothing. It's about joy, but there's no joy in the music. There's no groove. There's no funk. There's no feel. I, it's fine as a number nine pop single, but it's just not very good. I remember Budapest Ooh. came out in 2014. And I didn't mind that song. It's like yeah, this one. It's, it's, it's catchy, inoffensive. you got to make your money when you can. I'm not giving it to be too hard for that. It's the Clap the NHS song. It feels very much like this is a joyous occasion and you will mark this joyous occasion by performatively clapping your hands. The song itself doesn't trigger me. It's not. I don't find it egregious. It's not awful to listen to. It's just there, as I've said. It's milk toast as anything. But George Ezra just doesn't seem like the kind of person that I'd want to get into because he doesn't seem like he has much artistic integrity. I just did want to clarify that I understand people are going to play these events. That's fine. Just because I'm a staunch socialist doesn't mean other people are going to be. What I don't understand is he had seven songs that charted really high. Why pick that one? It's more his most upbeat one. Like, it's really just generically upbeat. Shotgun was massive, like... Yeah. At the beginning of lockdown and all that sort of stuff. That was played at a friend of mine's cremation. I actually quite like that song. It's fine. I have a bit of a soft spot for George Ezra because my youngest son, Tom, not you, Tom. Tom is not my son. My youngest son, Tom, will ask our Google Assistant to play Green Green Grass, Blue Blue Sky, Better for a Party of the Day or Die. Like that. That's how he'll say it. So that sort of makes it a bit more relatable to me. So that's partly, I guess, why I like it more than I would otherwise. Although the other two tracks that he always requests are It's Gonna Be Me by NSYNC and Gee. Wannabe by the Spice Girls. And not so it's gonna be my. <laughs> Unrelated tangent, but it's hot off the press, so you'll want to know. I've got my It's Gonna Be May outfit. I bought myself a pair of red leather trousers because they're the most 2000s thing I could think of. So I just want to walk around the streets like I'm JC Chazes. That's nowhere near as 2000s is like ultra wide cut jeans with the chain. I'm thinking specifically NSYNC with Aerosmith at the Super Bowl is the most year 2000 thing I've ever witnessed in my life. It's just colliding in a kaleidoscope of colour and weird material. It's fantastic. We'll move on because obviously fashion isn't our forte. Nor is it that of our next entrant. (laughs) No, certainly not. So we will move back on to the music. In at number eight is a re-entry for Scottish singer-songwriter Lewis Capaldi. Released in September, the song Forget Me is back in the top ten after debuting at number one. It's from his second album, Broken by Desire to be Heavenly Sent. The music video is notable for its Wham! parody. Lewis Capaldi, welcome to the Cacophony Sessions. I would just like to congratulate you because this song is way better than Someone You Loved, but it's still 
absolute stale hamster piss. <laughs> At least on this one, he doesn't bellow the whole fucking thing like he's the sugar monster's son that's just won a competition to be a pop star. Instead, it's the nephew of Peter Capaldi singing banal lyrics about being really sad because a girl's forgotten about him. And God, I wish I could forget about Lewis Capaldi. I want to be quite careful here because he he comes across like a genuinely nice guy. He does. Yeah, I, he does. Yeah. And he's genuinely a cool and, dude. Yes. Yeah, he's, he seems like a genuinely nice guy and he's very open about mental health in a way that I think is really healthy for all of us to be. However, I agree. I really don't like the song and I actually quite like his singing voice. It's got that slight huskiness to it that's really popular at the moment. But the problem I have with this song, it starts, there's no intro. Mm. It's just straight in. That bothered me straight away. And uh, then I that's was an like, extra point size. And then I was listening to the music in this track. There are six songwriters on this song. Six. Max Martin is one of them. Yep. The music on this is a piano chord repeated over and over. It's two, isn't electro- it? Two chords? Yeah, like two chords with an electronic drum beat that comes, that's like a logic preset. Yeah, it's a, a Casio sh- demo. Yeah, you know, and a shit ton of reverb. I could make this in Cubase in about 10 minutes. Yeah. And it's got six songwriters. I know I'm a music snob who cares what the music's doing and doesn't really care what the singer's doing. He's got a nice voice, but that's all this song is. I don't even think he's got that. For me, I actually watched the Todd in the Shadows video where he did a rundown of of Someone You Loved back in 2019 when that came out. And he summed it off up best by saying that he didn't say it, he just showed the clip. But it is just the most annoying sound in the world from Dumb and Dumber. (laughs) It's just that over a really shit instrumental. It's really bad. It's produced by English duo TMS, who have a wonderful catalogue that includes collaborations with Baby Rexer and Maroon 5. I know they've worked with Dua Lipa as well, but Broken Clock's right twice a day. I get why he's popular, other than the fact that he has a famous uncle. Is he? Yeah, Doctor Who, Peter Capaldi. He's quite an affable chap, and he comes across as quite funny. But it's like Adele. Adele is someone whose music does not match her personality. Adele is this vibrant, really funny character, but she makes these really sombre piano ballads most of the time. And Lewis Capaldi is basically just happy shopper Adele here. He's just making piano ballad after piano ballad that sound vaguely sad. But it's a contrast with his character, much like it is with Adele. But at least Adele's are interesting. At least you get some personal emotion from it. With this, the lyrics never really describe what's happened or what caused the girl to leave him and make him sad. It's not a self-reflection. It's basically that meme that the ginger guy crying just want her back. Personally, I'm not, I've never been a big fan of just singer-songwriters in general. I'm very anti just wanky acoustic music about getting dumped it's for me it's very easy to write and there's so many people that you see it on the local level whenever there's bands playing on like a night they've always got one acoustic guy at the start who's pretty talented and makes okay songs and he's just one of them but somehow i put him in the same category as ed sheeran sad acoustic pop music that Mm. mums like to sing when they're driving their kids to school it's okay it's not like terrible i think the chorus is quite strong to be honest but it's yes. just not my thing i think he's a good singer and all that stuff it's just i've heard this song a thousand times in the car and i didn't like it the first time and i still don't like it but it's one of those, it's so inoffensive to me that i can see why people do it's just meh that's it meh <laughs> The guy seems pretty nice. That's about it, really. I do feel bad to give somebody who does seem like a thoroughly nice bloke a bit of a kick in. But this is a music podcast and I'm listening to pop singles. I'm not going to beat around the bush and say that, oh, I like it because he's a nice guy. You can like something in spite of somebody being a dick. But on the other hand, you can also not like something in spite of the fact that they seem like a nice character. It's one of those songs where you don't understand why it's so popular. Because Mm. I can't imagine in any scenario, many people I know, or even most people I always think would like a song, would choose to go, fuck, I'm going to stick on that song. It's so beige. Why would you feel like I'm going to listen to this song for the 20th time? I don't see a scenario where it would be this popular and it stay in the charts for so long. But apparently it has, and I'm missing something as usual. This is the sort of singing style that's in, that's popular in the moment. And he yeah. is one of those people who he's going to sell out stadiums for the next 10 years. And 
that'll be what happens. <laughs> An interesting point you say that's what's popular at the moment because to give some further context, we've been trying to reschedule this for a few weeks. We listen to the chart a lot, and I think there's only about 14 different tracks across the three or four weeks in the chart. But what I'm finding is that I'm listening to albums and that there are some really good albums coming out this year and it's not matching the state of pop music. A lot of these tracks are a little bit older or have been around at the charts for a good, like this has been in the charts for about 20 weeks or so, or where it's come back in, but it was in the charts. It was released in November. I don't think that the top 10 fairly represents what's popular in music anymore. No, right? I think this style of music is what kind of like downbeat mumble rap is in America right now and it's just yeah. every song which is like basically Drake this is the English equivalent I think yeah yeah you're right I'd rather have this I think that at the moment the charts are just reflecting people that don't really seek out music all these songs are really popular because they're on adverts it's for people that put on the first thing that they music buy. happens to them rather than the other way around nobody's yes. seeking any of these records it's almost like the top 10 is being dictated to us by the media. It's a little bit insidious. I'm not quite sure that this is necessarily a problem with music. I think that the charts themselves are failing in their metrics. I think we'll see that as we go through. I just wanted to reiterate, I quite like what you guys said about him in that he seems like a good guy. Apparently he's going through you know, sort of his own mental health problems and a lot of mm. it stems ironically from what we've been talking about where I don't think Lewis Capaldi thinks of himself as being very good, oh, which okay. is interesting. I think he sees himself, apparently, he's got this new Netflix documentary show about him out at the moment, and he talks about it in there where he's got a bit of imposter syndrome, where he doesn't think he should be having the success he's having. Which I is agree ironic with him. I mean, he's okay. probably right, <laughs> but he's funny and in a way, and he's a nice guy, and he's got a decent voice. Yes, it's not necessarily what I would want, but it's not a terrible voice. The songs are I really not, don't like not what I like, but it's him highlighting mental health problems and which that's is always good. good. But yes, he's boring. That's like it's saying we're going to judge Metallica because James Hetfield was like hunting. It's just completely, I know, there's no I difference. Know. It's just, who cares? You just like, want to root for nice people, I think. That's all. I always attack the art, not the artist. If it comes across as a personal thing, it's not. I don't know. You were pretty way. strongly against Morrissey when we chatted about him. <laughs> oh, yeah, but Morrissey deserves it because Morrissey's a cunt. But Lewis Capaldi probably doesn't deserve to be described in such a term. And is, as I've said, seems like a nice guy. The song is meant to be personal. And I it, that made me like it less because I was like, oh, I don't really get any of the trauma that he's trying to sing about. I was it personal if six people had to write for you. Yeah, yeah, maybe then, if Lewis Capaldi isn't the artist that he wants to be, and he doesn't feel that he's doing himself any favours, then maybe we'll see the true Lewis Capaldi, and maybe we'll see him do something different and go in a different direction. I'll be the <laughs> first person here saying, yeah, do you know what? That Jungle Lewis Capaldi album was pretty fucking slapping. As long as he doesn't do what a lot of artists seem to be doing at the moment, just put on a pretend Jamaican accent, it's really got my nerves. <laughs> That's never going to go out of British pop music. Even David Bowie was doing it in the 80s. Don't Look Down and Songs On Tonight. Have you ever heard Jamaican Jerk Off by Elton John from 1973 on Goodbye Yellow Brick Road? I haven't. It's just I'm not offensive. going to. It's just offensive. He's just doing a stupid voice. It's like when I was talking about Paul McCartney last month. There's a legacy of British music where they are just making offensive stereotypical voices. Yeah. They weren't just, trying it's, to, It's just but they part were. of our history, man. That's what we do. Mm. So we'll move on to the number seven song. It's a song that was also formerly at number one. It slipped to number two last week and has fallen further this week. It's produced by Kid Harpoon and Tyler Johnson, and it's the lead cut from Endless Summer Vacation, the eighth album from American singer Miley Cyrus. She has eight albums. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> she's been going since 2009. She was a Disney sweetheart, and now she is essentially the new Stevie Nicks. That's what she's being billed as by many critics Fuck at off. the moment. <laughs> I think there's a lot of comparisons to her voice, and she did do a duet with Stevie Nicks on the previous album. There was also a mix of one of her singles with Edge of Seventeen. So she's worked with Stevie Nicks quite recently, and she has a rock rasp to her voice. So I think that's where no, the comparisons are being drawn. That annoys me so much. Because Stevie Nicks is a songwriting legend, not a ghostwriting media darling, Nepo baby, <laughs> who sounds like she smokes 400 fags a day. 
this is basically just a diss track, right, with a backing track yeah. off a Casio keyboard from the 90s. No, I disagree with you there. <laughs> the way this is mixed, the backing sounds awful. My Casio keyboard from the 90s could have played this song. It's fine. It's only in the charts because it's a Bruno Mars diss track. Wasn't it that they played the Bought You Flowers song at their wedding or something? And yeah. then her husband cheated on her. So now they've incorporated this as a diss against her husband. Oh, it's Liam Hemsworth. It's, it's one of the two. The song is When I Was Your Man by Bruno Mars. And yeah. that was played at their wedding dedicated to Miley from Liam Hemsworth. I didn't even know they were married. The lyrics of that song are basically the same as the lyrics in this song, but sung from the alternative perspective. So it's an interpolation of a previous Bruno Mars song. I quite like the inventiveness of it, though, because at least it's a kind of call and response to a former song and not just copying it ad verbatim yeah. like Metro Boomin did. Is this the 2023 I Don't Want No Pigeons? <laughs> <laughs> it's the 2023 Fuck You Right Back. Yeah, Frankie and Eamon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's also got I Will Survive, the strings from that song put over the chorus. Yeah, I actually really like this song. I think it's the best one in the top 10. I quite liked it when it was number one. It's in the same spirit as About Damn Time by Lizzo. It's not as good as that song. But it's funky. There's at least some sort of meaning to the lyrics. It's personal between Miley Cyrus and her ex-husband. It's got some fun samples. It's danceable. Her voice, I think, is great on it. And I actually listened to the whole album. This is the best song on the album. Problem is with this song is the verses are okay, but the chorus is trash. I disagree. I think it's a bad chorus. Yeah, I, I disagree. Just, I'm I, just, I don't think it's a very I good chorus. I think it's quite catchy. Love me better. I can love me better, baby. Can love me better. It's catchy. It reminds me of Kylie in a weird way. Yeah. It's just trash. I didn't like her at all. I didn't know anything about her. I didn't know she was married to Bruno Mars. I didn't know she got married to Liam Hemsworth. About... She was married to Liam Hemsworth. Yeah, she was married to Bruno, Bruno Mars. Whatever. Who Ain't cares? nobody tying Bruno down. Was she Hannah Montana? Is that her? She... Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She's That's been right. going since 2009 and she was Hannah Montana. She was a Disney darling. As people that have observed pop music over the last 10 years, we've witnessed her go from being Hannah Montana through Wrecking Ball being naked. Wrecking on the Ball wrecking was a ball. great song. Okay. Yeah. And twerking with Robin Thicke in one of those awards ceremonies. She's had a lot of low moments in her career, but I think that she's starting to come into her own as a decent pop star. I mean, she's no Lady Gaga, but she's interesting enough. I'd rather listen to this song 10 times than a Lewis Capaldi album. I'd actually yeah. prefer Lewis Capaldi song than this. I hate to say no. I think I'm with Al. I don't dislike trash pop songs, but this is one of those ones when you're at like a wedding or something, there's about a hundred just trash pop songs and you end up liking half of them. Mm. Just this is in the other half where I'm just like, ugh. Yeah. Does that seriously? you? Ugh. As with the last song, it's been around for a while. We'll find that with the next song as well. I guess it depends on how many times you listen to it and how that improves your relationship with the song. There are certain songs that you listen to, you don't like it. You listen to it again, you might go, oh, I quite like that. The first time I heard this song, I was like, oh, it's just generic pop. And the more I've listened to it, because I've been keeping an eye on the charts recently, the more I like it. It's a grower, this one. It's been the opposite direction for me because my nurse does Radio 2 on at work and this has been on a lot. And... This song has not got better with time. The first time I heard it, I knew the history about it because it was all over the press. Mm. And the first time I heard it, it was like, oh, that's quite cool. It's quite clever how she's interpreting the lyrics. And there's a lot of thought process behind this song, more so than several others on the chart, yeah. which is good. But for me, the way that thought process has been performed, it makes it a very throwaway pop track for me. So yeah, I'm with Al. I don't want to listen to a throwaway pop track particularly. I don't really want to listen to Lewis Capaldi either, to be fair. That's like asking which side do I want a nail stuck through. I just remembered that she's Billy Ray Cyrus's daughter. That's Yes. Hence why I, I refer to her as a Nepo baby. Hence yeah, why she has a sense. career in the first place. The same as fucking Jack Whitehall was a comedian. Untalented dick. <laughs> we'll go to number six because maybe in at number six there'll be a song that isn't by an Epo Baby. After 46 weeks on the chart, peaking at number one and already making the Cacophony Sessions Goes Pop USA episode last year, number six is As It Was by Harry Styles. Still. I think you're selling it short. I've got it as 54 weeks on here. I no, think he's gone right. a year. We have to get the fact checker 3000 out of the cupboard. <laughs> Official singles chart, top 100. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm on the top 100. 
Yeah, and Dan's on the top 40. He didn't go straight to the top 40, then, maybe. That makes sense. 46 weeks in the top 40. That fact has been checked. Beep, beep, beep. Beep, beep, beep. Everything I said about this on the US episode is as it was. Way. We've already discussed it, and everybody knows it. The only thing I can think of that I didn't go into detail, I, how much I love the drumville at 228 at the very end of the song. Other than that, I think Jim said it, and I think you've said it before on, on the podcast hours, that you've started to go off this song. I did play the top 10 in its entirety. I didn't skip this, even though I'd heard it a million times. And I still sang along with it. So it still has some resonance there. It's actually funny you say that, because I was going to say, when it got to my turn, how I went full circle, where I no, I went well, half circle, I guess, to not liking it, because I overheard it. And I've gone full circle to just liking it again. <laughs> so it's just one of those songs. It's just pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. One thing I would say since our last episode, because he performed it at the Brit Awards, didn't he? Mm. Yeah. And I didn't like him performing. I didn't like his performance of it at the Brit Awards. Not because he performed it badly, but because one of the things I really love about this song is the way he sings it on the record. It's very wistful and considered. It's almost got that slight disinterested style to the way he sings it. Whereas performing it at the Brit Awards, it's not. You could perform it as a stadium filling anthem, but I think the beauty of the recording is that it isn't that. It's quite intimate. Yeah. I know, but we we know we're nitpicking it up point where he puts a bit of extra effort in for a live crowd. He put the effort in for the crowd and everything, but I didn't like the song as much performed that way. That's what I mean. I still love the song. I put it forward as an undeniable banger. I think the chorus is catchy. It's really well put together. I haven't stopped liking it. It's been on the radio for ages. Should we just get it out of the way? Is As It Was by Harry Styles an undeniable banger? I think it's already on the list. It's it? not on no, the list, no. No, we didn't pass it through because James... Banned James it. wouldn't have it, but he's not here now. We can't he's read not here. It. We've already yes, had we the boat. We've, we've already had the boat with more of us on than we have now. We can't. Other things got put back through. This is allowed to get put back through too. I'm but it's happy. still in the charts. I think it means it deserves another vote. I like it. That's been an undeniable banger. So go on. Yeah, I do. It's a, such a great song. I love the way it's everything's a bit <laughs> shit, and I like, and it's okay because I'm Harry Styles, and I'm everyone wants to shag me. So yeah, good on him. I'd love it if you were actually Harry Styles. Yeah, d just a slight disclaimer that Dan B is not Harry Styles. The only reason I'm saying that is because I don't want all the tweets. You guys don't handle the Cacophony Sessions Twitter handle. All those Swedes will be ref messaging. Yeah. Hi, is this Dan Rogan? <laughs> the Swedes will be loving this episode. Yeah, so many mentions. I know. It's a pity Zara Larsson didn't chart. Let's do the Swedish chart next episode. Number eight in Sweden. Now we're so massive in Sweden, we really should do the Swedish death metal episode. To be fair, the Swedish chart is very different to the UK one. Yeah, I'm just on there at the moment. Zara Larsson is on there. The Swedish chart, that's not happening. There's only one track from the UK top 10 that is in the Swedish top 10, and that's oh. Miley Cyrus Flowers. Well, as I said, it's the best one. <laughs> we don't need to cover Harry Styles anymore. Well no, done, Harry. Next. You're now on the undeniable banger list and we can put that to bed. If you're still there when we do the next one, we might take you off the list. We can skip number five as well if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> the only new entry. Why? What's at number five? a new entry that was made especially for the Cacophony Sessions podcast by American rapper Drake. We said <laughs> it might happen, and it did. It's Search and Rescue, his 38th top 10. I thought he was Canadian. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Canadian. Still, Canada is America, technically. America's got enough problems before you force Drake upon them. Seriously. <laughs> oh my god, I can't do another Drake run. I cannot summon the will or enthusiasm to talk about this for some reason, for the most popular artist in the world, despite having no good songs and barely any talent, it's incredible to me. I feel like it's one giant joke. I feel like I'm in a Truman show and the entire universe has been set up to convince me that Drake is a real artist. This is a whole song about where he's like several of the lines he's singing to his mummy. I quite like that bit, the Dalai That's mummy. Going on holiday, mommy. It's cute. It's not good. It's no, I'm not And I don't know what Dale is. What is Dale? I presume it's just Drake 
jumping on a Latino bandwagon. Then. All of his lyrics, gibberish. Every yeah. fucking lyric is gibberish. The lyrics are awful and they're seven songwriters. Apart from number 10, which doesn't count because it's just a bastardization. It's not even a song, it's a remake. Yeah, this has the highest number of songwriters of any of the songs on this list to come up with a repeated line where he's singing to his mummy and there's a made up word. I think he's sang to a girl. I don't think he's actually singing to his mum. Is he saying mummy? Latin trap, as we know, is, but he's not is a Latin. bit of a vibe in America. <laughs> no, but he, but Drake, are you telling me that there's a bandwagon and Drake isn't going to jump on it? I mean, because he will. And I think that's what he's doing. I think he's just doing this whole uh, Latin flirting. I think there's nothing more to it than that. I yeah. might be wrong. Drake isn't an artist. He's a corporation. No. And the fact that people still buy music is just completely yeah. letting him do it. It's annoying. Yeah. I don't get how somebody can auto-tune their voice to within an inch of its life and still sound like they can't sing. This is the worst song on the chart by mm. a long way. No. It is. Every single track on this list is better than Search and Rescue. Drake is probably the worst. I can't even call him an artist because he's not. Drake is the worst bot creating music that's been fucking broken. And this is probably the worst thing I've ever heard him do. And he's probably the worst artist in the last 10 years of famous. What is wrong with people that this is in the jar? I will record my dog's farts and we'll release it on Spotify. <laughs> and I will point the lyrics. <laughs> yeah, it'll have much deeper lyrics. You really cause... shouldn't say that when you've got an EP coming out. <laughs> people ain't going to download that now. <laughs> No, EP is just my dog's farts. We're Martin <laughs> guitar soloing over the top. I think Tom's onto something <laughs> here. Is he actually just an AI? Or is there some sort of weird algorithm thing involved in Drake? Like he's put a Kim Kardashian saying something on the song, which isn't really part of the song. None of it makes any sense. Was that just done to get Instagram hits so that this song would then be more popular? Yes. Yes. It's all just yes. that. There's no talent in this whatsoever. I couldn't mm -hmm. name you a single Drake song, yet he's like the biggest artist of the last 10 years. It, none of it adds up. I agree. This is all some sort of weird Truman Show thing. And like Al said, I'm bamboozled. This is easily what the worst last, one on the list. Was it Grease or something it's called? Like, I couldn't yeah. tell you. I remember like, that one. That was another one where it was saying where he just, sorry, I'm completely interrupting because I'm just annoyed again no, It's, now. it's but, fine. <laughs> that was another one. There's no song. There's no chorus. There's no verse. There's just him and he's being popular because he's him it's weird it's just so strange to me if you call yourself a music fan and you listen to drake you're not a music fan <laughs> like... i'll step in a bit there is and you're not a music fan because <laughs> take care is a good album and <laughs> you're if wrong. you're reading this it's too late is a good album and views is a good album you're wrong why do you keep being wrong yeah. scorpion has got bangers on it nice for what tune the problem oh, is since scorpion since 2018, Drake has worked out exactly what we are saying here. He has worked out that he can put anything out and people will buy it. He put anything out. Last year, he released a house album that was absolutely awful. It was terrible from start to finish, but people bought it. And he's still releasing singles. So you cannot sit here and say that this is the worst thing he's ever did. Because I sat there and listened to that house album last year. And it's way worse. So at least he's staying in his lane now. But this is nothing compared to the songs that made him famous. He hasn't done anything artistically great or even good in the last four or five years. He's just been resting on his laurels. And he makes shit loads of money from it. Can we just go straight to number four? I, I, like, the idea we're talking about him means that one more person might listen to him and it irritates me. I don't think he deserves any level no. of coverage. I guarantee you, in the next year, he'll get married to, I don't know, a royal or something else. Just something to give him more insta hits and then we'll have to listen to him for another ten years. Like, it's just... Yeah. Shit. He's not really a pop star. He's more like a music marketer in the same way that P. Diddy was in the 90s. As much as I can say I dislike P. Diddy, he still had a couple of good songs, and I think Drake's the same. You can't dismiss him all altogether, but I think largely his presence is just lazy. We'd I mean, start from the bottom, it's still pretty good tune. <laughs> You've got one yourself. P. Diddy worked with some other talented musicians, mm. and Drake is scraping the bottom of the barrel and elevating them to superstardom because of his marketing. So there's a bit of a difference there. P. Diddy worked with people who had some actual talent. Yeah. And I don't think there's a track with P. Diddy's fingerprints on it that is anywhere near as bad as this. I don't know. I haven't listened to any of uh, anything P. 
EP did he put out since about 2002 in terms of albums? Can't really verify that. But uh, I don't think this is that bad, this song. I would take this over Lewis Capaldi any day, simply because at least it has a sense of fun. Those lyrics are at least remotely cheesy, whereas Lewis Capaldi is just miserable. I can see why you don't like this, and I don't particularly like it, but if we're going to defend some of the people that we've had already, then I'm going to provide some balance just because I'm going to kick the wasp's nests a little bit here. <laughs> I don't really care. Us platforming Drake isn't going to give him any extra views or listens because yeah. the people are already buying whatever he'll put out. As Dan mentioned, in the Wikipedia article, it talks about how this song samples Keeping Up With The Kardashians, and that's apparently noteworthy. It's really not. If it was up to me, it would put him in a fucking rocket and shoot him into the sun. <laughs> <laughs> That Wait. would give him too much publicity. Thing is, he could have be it. dead. <laughs> he wouldn't be able to make more. He is also a nepo baby as well. I don't know what uh, that means. He's a beneficiary of having a rich. He parent. was in a Disney funny no, club. Drake's uncle is Larry Graham from Sly and the Family Stone, the inventor of slap bass. Oh no, I get that, but he was in the Disney oh, thing, no, Miley Cyrus thing. Isn't he? he was Degrassi in Canada, which is like their cheerleading but high he can't... school show. But he can't sing. He was started off as an actor, and then I think people just realised that he has a bit of a vibe to him. And he never really raps, he just talks. And sometimes his cadence sounds really cool when he can be bothered, but he hasn't done that in the last five years. So we can't be bothered to talk about him anymore. And we'll move on. At number four is a song that slipped down a place from number four to number five last week, but is back up to its peak position again. It's the wonderfully named Divine Ikebor, known professionally as Rima. He is a Nigerian singer-songwriter. He released the song Calm Down in February, and it's been enjoying chart success ever since, largely thanks to TikTok. I actually really like this. I like it a little bit more every time I listen to it because when we yeah. first proposed to do this about three weeks ago, I was like, oh, I don't really like this. And I accidentally listened to the <laughs> Selena Gomez remix yeah. and I really didn't like that. Last week, I was oh, it's actually just the solo version. And it improves the song just by virtue of taking her off because I think she adds nothing to the song. I don't think she adds anything to it, but I don't think she made it particularly worse. I listened to this version before I listened to the Selena Gomez version. Mm. And... I don't hate what she does to it, but I do. I probably slightly prefer the solo version. Yeah, I just don't think her voice goes with the backing instrumentation. His voice works with it, and hers doesn't. What I find odd is that the vocal style he's using is really popular at the moment. Like, mm. I don't really know how to describe it other Them than Jamaican. No, it's. I've it's... got Akon on Prozac. Yeah. Yeah, it's this sort of wet blanket male vocal thing going on. With this chap, I like how he does it, whereas I don't particularly like Akon and that sort of thing. So mm. I like the way the vocal is. I like the guitar hook because it reminds me of like early 2000s indie, which will always make me happy. And having been going out with a Sudanese girl and listening to lots of African rhythms, I think African rhythms just now, I'm instantly interested now where I normally wouldn't be. So African rhythm, early 2000s indie guitar, nice vocal, happy. Can't wait for you to go on your fella cootie arc. When I was at uni, I listened to lots of fella cootie. I've always dabbled with African music, and I went through a phase of listening to loads of Algerian blues. This isn't yeah. really Afro beat in the no, it isn't. Sense. But it's but there's an element of African rhythm in there. Yeah, it's Afro pop. You can see why people would be drawn to it on TikTok. It says the word lockdown twice in succession, and people go, oh. I remember Lockdown, so I like this song. It's very much the Peter Kay effect of what he was doing to comedy in the 2000s of, do you remember this? I remember this, therefore I'm a fan of you. Even though he uses the word lockdown not in reference to a COVID lockdown. No, but that's why it's on TikTok. Because as a species, we are fickle and we can only have about three or four buzzwords doing the rounds at any given time. I'm with you, Will. When I first heard this, I instantly was like, oh, I don't think I like this. Mm. But every repeat listen, I've liked it more. Yeah. Because it is a bit of an earworm. And mm. I just think it's pretty good. It's pretty much what you guys said. It's just really catchy. I think his verses are better than hers. I haven't heard any other version of this. So for me, it's just part of the song. So I think it's, I thought it was all right. Yeah, listen to the version without her on it, the yeah. original version, because the remix, there's nothing wrong with Selena Gomez. And she doesn't do anything horrendous on it. It feels a bit unnecessary. And that the song works just as well, if not better, without her. It's just catchy. It's a bit of an earworm song, isn't it? I don't have TikTok, so I don't know 
if it's popular on there or not. The artwork for the single I really like as well. On the subway. It's the giant teddy bear thing sat on the subway carriage. Yeah, that's it's it. Yeah. One, yeah, I really like that for some reason. I feel pretty similar to you guys in that I like the song. I don't love it. It's not. There's nothing incredible about it, but it's just one that you can have on in the background and go, yeah, it's not too bad. Second Lilt reference of the episode. My favorite line from the song is, girl, you sweet like Fanta, Fanta. Uh, and as we know, Lilt has now changed to Fanta Tropical or whatever. So there we go. Let's shoehorn <laughs> that Lilt reference in. Great lyric. Hang on. We may be onto a conspiracy here because Fanta is now owned by I the think same it's now, company as Lilt. Lilt is now Fanta Tropical or something because they've got rid of Lilt and it's now a sub flavor of yeah, Fanta. Yeah, Fanta, pineapple and grapefruit. You're That's not the making one. it up. So maybe Fanta maybe are controlling is... the charts. And that's why when I said that the charts don't really represent what I think people are listening to and more what people are being forced to listen to. Being forced by Big Soda. By Fanta, who I bet are owned by Coca-Cola. They are indeed, as was Lilt. Do you know why Lilt is being rebranded? It's because it was accused of cultural appropriation. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing surprises me anymore. <laughs> Shout out to Selena Gomez. Only Murders in the Building is very good. She's great in it. You should watch that. It's on Disney+. Plus. We'll move on to number three. Down to number three this week, after entering the chart at the top spot a couple of weeks back, is Eyes Closed, the lead single from forthcoming album Subtract by English singer-songwriter Ed Sheeran. His 14th number one. 14? Want me to read my notes? Yeah, go for it. Absolute shite for mums in their kitchen. The whole theme of the song is so cliched, it's ridiculous. It's the same as dancing with myself. Or What is it about any theme where you're dancing with your eyes closed or any yeah. level of dancing by yourself or dancing? Why does it make it deeper or anything? Like, it should be a song about it. It's fucking bollocks. No one dances by themselves unless they're wasted and they're the last person at the club. It's ridiculous. <laughs> in my head, it's just Ed Sheeran at a silent disco being a bellend. But I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> that is <Sorry>. the song. <laughs> it gets me quite annoyed at this because people are going... Oh, the lyrics are about so there was somebody that he knew who died, and people are suggesting that the lyrics on this were about that when the song was already written. Yeah, and it was a cliched song that you're adding an inferred meaning to. Mm -hmm. The receptionists at my work were talking about this, and it really annoyed me because the song existed before then. I know it's sad inferring this meaning if that meaning had been intended, but it wasn't. This is just an even worse version of Castle on the Hill, isn't it? Ed Sheeran is known for doing production and doing production for other people. Where's the production on this? There's this percussion He's noise. not a great producer. The only song of his that is actually half danceable is Sing, and that's produced by Pharrell Williams. So, of course, it is. If you get Ed Sheeran producing a dance track, you end up with Shape of You, which is awful. No, Ed Sheeran is not a good producer, and he writes everything for himself. So when he's writing for other artists, they all just feel like they are Ed Sheeran with the voice of another person because he's not capable of writing from another person's perspective. Every single song it's just ed sheeran i'm miserable because there's some vague sadness that's happened it's the same way that fucking afterlife by ricky gervais is held up as being sad it's not sad just think about it for a second it's only sad because you're being told it's sad sorry rant over apparently the percussion is done on the guitar but it, it sounds awful doesn't it it's not just me that percussion sound that's yeah. going on sorry that was air quotes for the people listening to this on a podcast platform i realize yeah. and for those that are just listening please check out the youtube channel cacophony sessions tv where you can see the opening gambit of the episode for free or give us five pounds and watch the whole thing yeah because if you watch the whole thing you'll get to see my dog who's now in frame who's <laughs> yeah. far i would rather listen to than drake new section of the cacophony sessions podcast it is doggo vision <laughs> i don't think we've had an ed sheeran song no we've charted, really good slamming we've been covering and he's somebody who i have almost stuck up for in the past a little bit because I think, for instance, if you're comparing Lewis Capaldi and Ed Sheeran's vocal performances, I think that Ed Sheeran wins that hands down. I think Ed Sheeran's got a decent voice. There is a little bit to him about his character. And again, like Lewis Capaldi, he seems like a nice enough chap. But it yeah. is just the same song over and over again. Just some, oh, there's a reference to me being at a pub or buying some 
cheap English meal and I've got lots of mates and I'm a normal person and I do normal things. No, you're not, Ed Sheeran. You make so much money that none of this is identifiable with you anymore. Can we please just hear how much you want to fucking ride a Libya Rodrigo or just go full on bad boy and just have a cocaine bitch? Okay, I'm not advocating for drugs, but do something interesting, please. I want to discuss something interesting. This is not it. Well, I put him in the, to be honest, Jack Capaldi's in the exact, sorry, well, I don't matter what his fucking first name is, but like... Tony Capaldi. Tony Capaldi, who cares? I oh, put him in legend. A, I put Ed Sheeran in the same group as him, and I, quite frankly, I put Justin Bieber in the same group. It's like, there's these people where I can't hate them because they become millionaires off writing their own songs, which everyone seems to like. Yeah. They just happen to be really popular. Bieber, Bieber, that, he wrote that song when he was like 14, he made him like a multi-millionaire. So you can't be I angry. I prefer Bieber to Sheeran. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but, oh, you know, I don't, uh, At least no. Bieber knows where to go away for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, Ed Sheeran doesn't. I don't think he had much choice in that, really, to but, be fair. Ed's got quite a few good singles. I'm going to stand up for him a little bit and say that whilst this song here is garbage, it's pure shit, some of his other songs are all right. I really like the one with Camila Cabello, Bam Bam, which, okay, he's not in that much, but she's fantastic. I would... Get up a list of all of his songs and go, at least four of them are okay. Back in 2014, the best Ed Sheeran track appeared on the Sons of Anarchy soundtrack and was in one of the episodes of that. It's called Make It Rain. It's played on one of the episodes. And the thing about Sons of Anarchy is what's her face? The actress from Futurama who plays Leela. She is one of the main characters in Sons of Anarchy. Every time that show has a poignant moment, they always have her singing an acoustic ballad and it really winds me up because it just takes me out of the emotional setup. In one of the episodes, they take her voice out and put Ed Sheeran's in and I was ready for rage, but it was genuinely quite affecting and enjoyable. He's very capable as a songwriter. I think he's got a great grasp of melody and he does have an ear for a good hook. There's many things that he is good at but I just wish this was a better song, but it never seems to be. Even Bad stuff. Habits, which he did like last year or the year before, was like quite a good one. one. I didn't that like was that one. a bit one. more upbeat. See, I remember his first album coming out, and I really enjoyed like the A-Team and Lego House. Lego House, like, yeah. Yeah, he's never really progressed from there, though. Thinking Out Loud's all right. So... Is it, though? Because Is it, though? Yeah. It's one of those where you hear it, you hear it, thinking out loud and you think oh that's quite a nice song and then it's played everywhere and then you go hang on isn't this just let's get it on by marvin gay it's the same chord progression thinking out loud i don't think is a passable tune in my opinion maybe ed sheeran is an album track guy i haven't listened to any of his albums but the single i have tend to like. because Bryony likes ed sheeran she went and saw him live in cardiff a few years back and we've got the first three albums plus multiply and divide those three of course she likes them yeah. she's a mum and it's designed the mum albums rocks. like are on in the car sometimes and i'm like yeah this isn't terrible there's an interesting mix i don't get the hate i think yeah, he's it's, not as hate, good as his success but he's not as i hate beige, beige. But he's not as beige boring. as Louis capaldi that was really boring but it's the same i had to make this choice earlier today what am i going to listen to now Louis capaldi or ed sheeran so thank you podcast for making me do that to my listening <laughs> history on apple music but it had to happen one day but i made the choice i clicked ed sheeran first and i do enjoy the song more than i enjoyed lewis capaldi's i don't like either of them in terms of previous releases i think they're both fine as people but this isn't the cacophony sessions judges who's a nice person podcast we'd have about half the listener base what are the other six of you gonna do to quote Martin, who isn't here, it's just not for me. This songwriting and music style is just something I find incredibly tedious. I quite liked it in 2011. So when Plus came out, I quite enjoyed it, actually. I'm not going to lie. but I've never listened to it the whole way through, so I can't judge. So I have. I quite enjoyed it. And then the problem I have with it is that everything that he's tried to do outside of the Ed with an acoustic guitar, for me, hasn't landed. On Divide, Castle on the Hill is probably like the strongest song. I actually don't mind that song because I used to play open mic nights and as soon as that song came out, every person at an open mic night was covering that song. Everybody. And so I heard it all the time. And I quite like it. It's got a strong chorus. But Perfect, another song on that album that's got over 2 billion listens on Spotify, I don't like. 
at all. I quite like a razor on that album. In fact, that is possibly my favorite album of his, which is a weird statement to make about Ed Sheeran, to be honest with you. Ed Sheeran is actually a cracking guitarist. When you listen to the guitar work on a razor, it's really good. I also quite liked his appearance on Yesterday, the Beatles film, which just takes us back to the other episode. He's in it as a sort of weird mentor to the guy who becomes the guy, the world loses his mind and he's the only one who knows the Beatles. And Ed Sheeran is hearing this guy's songs and he's like, wow, you're amazing. But that Hey Jude song, can we change it to Hey Dude? That would be way more successful. And I think he plays into the, oh, Ed Sheeran's a cock kind of stigma yeah. when they say hey dude do they then make a reference to cooler shaker they did the song hey dude yeah if which they is, did it went over my it is a banger that first cooler shaker album hey um, yeah it's amazing i bought it on cassette and it came out tapvar is an undeniable banger i would agree with you on that <laughs> yeah it is and hey dude probably as well anyway yesterday then i got a feeling ed sheeran's probably quite good in it i've never seen it he just plays the douchey, annoying, is he I'm Ed Sheeran, I'm amazing. He's himself. Yeah. Right, okay. But okay. he's purposefully built up as being this a bit annoying guy, which is quite nice that he's willing to make himself... Method acting, is he? Yeah, because I remember when he rocked up in Game of Thrones. Yeah, Game of Thrones. So effectively just playing Ed Sheeran in Game of Thrones. It just takes you out of Lord that Lord Ed of House Sheeran. It was so bad. I'm not going to watch yesterday because... I just don't like the concept of that movie anyway, but I, it's, it's good. But at least he's good in it playing himself, I guess. I don't want to talk about Ed Sheeran anymore. Neither do I. Yeah. Let's move on. In that's second fair. place, the second place chart position this week goes to a song that's been going steadily for 13 weeks on the chart and now climbs to its highest position. The song is called People. It's the first UK top 40 entry for Cameroonian singer Libyanka. My notes go, I think I might actually like this. And that's it's all good. the notes. That's all the notes. I like it. I like the sentiment behind what she's trying to sing about. Like, it's, yeah, it's decent. I will probably never listen to it again. But if it comes on, I won't dislike it. Copy paste. <laughs> that's pretty much me. I thought it's pretty good. I think I like it. I like her yeah. delivery. I think she's got good voice. It sounds original enough. It's, yeah. yeah, I think it's an acceptable song. It occupies the same sort of space as Rima in Calm Down they're bops you just vibe along with them and they're fine and I, it, they're probably I'm not going to go back to either of them much I have listened to this one a little bit more though because it, it's come because on because it's my... been in the charts for a few weeks and we were going to record it three weeks ago yeah, yeah that's happened but I have dabbled in a little bit of TikTok because you can now find the cacophony sessions on TikTok the song is obviously she's saying she's drinking too much and no one has taken enough care to actually check in on her. The thing I liked about it is written that way from her perspective, but the message itself is so hateable. Obviously, I think it's on purpose, but the lyrics almost show an unawareness of her own responsibility, lack of responsibility for it. That sounds a bit, maybe it's overthinking it, but that's the impression I get sometimes. But it's like, oh, no one's checking on me, but then you'd be like, well, fuck, the problem's fucking self out. I don't know. So that's the message I got from it. But I quite yeah, liked it. <laughs> I think the, the cover to the single is her lost in a crowd, and I think that's quite symbolic of the song itself. She's got problems, but nobody's noticing, and I don't think anything's getting any better as a consequence of that. It's almost like she's lost in plain sight. It's a bit deeper than a lot of the other songs on the, the top ten, but because it's only a three-minute throwaway pop song, it's hard to explore. I think this may be a song where, and it may be the only one on the list, actually, where I would actually say, it might be worth checking out the album by Libby Anka. I would be intrigued to hear what the album sounds like, whereas the rest of the singles, I can probably wrap up and forget them and not go back to those artists again this year. But Is this her first it, single? So I've never yeah. heard of them. It's a bit of a breakout tune then. She's had two other no, singles before, according to on Spotify. There's a couple of other singles from before that were nothing that, has started like, in the UK top 40. Oh, like, yeah, nothing's started before. There's yeah, a few other songs. Things. Yeah, there's a few other things on Spotify. This is her breakout single. It's actually, I looked up there's a, the story behind it. It's to do with the diagnosis. She's got a mood disorder that's like Psych similar to bipolar. Psychosomia or something? Yeah. 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 It's a, yeah. It's similar to bipolar, but without the big peaks and troughs. I think it's a grower because like we were saying, yes. we've been trying to sort this out for a few weeks, this podcast, and it's been on the chart for those three weeks. And I didn't like it at first. I thought it was a bit boring, a bit throwaway, simple. 
But the more I've listened to it, the more I've gone, oh, actually, there is something more there. There's a bit more meaning behind it. Is it a banga? No, it's not, but it's decent. And I think we'll keep it there. Yeah. So what's number one? At number one, and holding on to its number one spot for the second week, it is the first collaboration since 2014 for Scottish producer Calvin Harris and English singer Ellie Goulding. This is his 11th number one and her fourth time at the summit of the UK pop charts. So the song's called Miracle and it is effectively an old school trance song condensed into three minutes. What are we thinking? My notes read like this. Are you having a fucking laugh? Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down, Calvin. You ain't no Robert Miles. <laughs> this could have easily been on any dance hits of any year of the 1990s. And Ellie Goulding, seven-year-old with a 20-a-day habit, his stick has really started to wear thin now. But that's as far as my notes went. So I, I just put, thought it was like wanting to be castle in the sky, but it's a thousand times worse. Yeah, it's a sand castle in the sky. <laughs> yeah, basically. Calvin Harris actually makes a decent trance tune, which Ellie Goulding actively detracts from by deciding that dance music vocals do not need to contain any personality or emotion in 2023. The piano is also way too fucking loud, but there's a nice synth bass sound and the snare sound I think is quite nice. But I think in a lot of these songs that this is essentially aping, the trans songs from the early 2000s, Tocca's Miracle by Fragma around 2000, 2001, that kind of thing, it became far more of a mainstream genre. And this is like that, but I think a lot of the things that I liked about those songs they often had vocalists who were very european and had like thick accents or had a vague understanding of english so the lyrics didn't even make any sense and i think that added to the tunes because they almost had this weird exotic sense to them and this has none of that because it's almost like ellie golding has grown up listening to the logical song as performed by scooter and has gone that is the very epitome of pop music vocals and we must make all songs sound like that forevermore because her voice is so thin and awful and has no character whatsoever and i've never liked a single thing that she puts out whether it's some whispery oh. folk stuff or some dance music she always makes it sound like it's an advert for Twining's Tea or something like that. And it's just rubbish. And I can't stand it anymore. And why on earth they would ever do this after nine years of not doing it and then come back to make a random song that sounds like something made 20 years ago. And the only way this could ever work is in an extended remix. If this was seven minutes long and Calvin Harris took the time to build a good tune, he'd probably do it because he's a decent producer. But this, with Ellie Golding, is naff and it's crap. My friend Lewis was really, no, not Capaldi, was really into Ellie Goulding when her first album came out. And we used to listen to that when we were drinking quite a lot. And it's fine. But I think as time goes on, the more I hear her, the less flexibility she seems to have in her vocal delivery. It just doesn't do it for me. It just doesn't, it just doesn't work for me. If I want to listen to a female singer-songwriter who has the voice of a small child... Joanna Newsom is far more interesting. Actually, Joanna Newsom is fantastic, but she has got a very interesting singing voice. This sounds like I've got Dance Mega Mix 1998 right somewhere on cassette, and this could easily have been on that. But it's not as good as that. I had to go back and I had to listen to another chance by Roger Sanchez and you mentioned Robert Miles, uh, Dreams yeah. by Robert Miles. Oh, yeah. infinitely better than this song. Calvin Harris could never recreate that sound because it was very contemporary in the 90s. Making something like that now doesn't really serve as a purpose. It just feels like Calvin Harris is just showing off and going, oh, look, I could have made old school dance tunes as well. Well, no, you can't really, mate. Not if you pick Ellie Goulding as your lead vocalist. And also you can't if you're doing it on Logic because Logic didn't exist or whatever Pro Tools because none of that shit existed when they were mm. doing it in 1995. Some of the okay. instrumental stuff in this is pretty good, to be honest. When it goes around, you believe in a miracle and then the do 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 bit kicks in and then it gets a boom. Like it does 
make my head want to bang and <laughs> I enjoy it. I know the vocals aren't brilliant, but the song's quite enjoyable. And like you said, if there was an extended sort of seven minute version where we were all in a club and drinking and jump, I think we would quite enjoy it. I don't think it would be a problem. It does give me vibes of those late 90s sort of songs. And I think we'd probably quite happily get stupid to this. If there's a seven minute extended version, I'm not listening to that at home. <laughs> no. If they take the Ellie Golding the lead cognac. vocal off, I will. But I don't, I don't want to listen to her go on for seven minutes. Again, like Lewis Capaldi and Ed Sheeran, I'm sure she's lovely, but I don't want to listen to any more of her music ever. It feels like water torture to me. Al, you're smiling. The what? song is an absolute belter. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, this is easily my favourite song in the top ten. I've <laughs> added it to pretty much every one of my other playlists. And I think it's an <laughs> like you say, like Bellin says, it sounds a bit like Castles in the Sky. Castles in the Sky is like one of my favorite songs of all time. I like <laughs> any 90s dance music with any female vocalist like that. I fucking love it. If it's if, it, if I'm going to a Zumba room and I'll be playing it, I like it. I like my Zumba Oh, music. yeah, we forgot you like Zumba and music. And <laughs> this is an absolute belter. What do you say about Finn Voice? Who the fuck cares? It's a fucking trance song. It is all we need is a high pitched woman going, eh. Singing about, I don't know, talking about, I don't know, jumping off cliff, jumping off that cliff, you know, any, anything, don't matter. I think the, the tunes are great on it. I could have longer of it because I just enjoy it, but I don't care if it's short. I think you guys are nitpicking just because it sounds a bit like, I think it sounds better than a lot of the mighty stuff I've listened to personally. It sounds better than Cascadia I've listened to. Yeah, and that's it, terrible. Yeah, but I, they, they were one the biggest. That's you know late I mean? noughties. That's when it started you know I mean? to get a like, bit. Iffy. I think it's absolutely class. I was waiting for you guys to burn yourself out on your rants because I think you're wrong. If it was up to me, this would be an undeniable banger on the list right now. I think it's fucking class. If you say Dreams by Robert Miles, I'd let you yeah, have that. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. absolutely. Easily. It's not even close. It's on this list. I enjoyed this tenfold more than every other song because it hits the exact <laughs> level of cheesy <laughs> dance music. I really do understand that. And I do wish that I, because I've come into this episode and most of the episodes, I tend to be a little bit more enthusiastic about modern music. But in this episode, this has been the unraveling of Dan Whittle. And I must make a note to myself here and say, this is not the state of music. This is just the music that I'm being forced to listen to. And that's always going to ha- create a- an adverse reaction with myself anyway, because I don't like being told what to listen to. But I really do wish that I'd enjoyed more of these songs. There's nothing greater in pop music than discovering a new sound to listen to. What I've discovered from this song is that I am ready for 90s dance music to come back in a big way. I might be the like, only person on this podcast who would be actually blasting the radio for the first time. Oh, in no, life I would love I'm, that. I'm ready because I'm sorry, like after dubstep and all the shit and then mumble rapping with weird trap beats and I'm ready for some just upbeat tunes. And this, for me, this is one of them. When I first heard it, I was there like, have I, have I heard this song already? Like 10 years ago? I, don't, it has, I think it hit every nostalgia reset through my brain. And I was like, yeah, done. I, I, I've loved it. Like when we were talking about the last song, I was listening to this one. Just, yeah, just pretend he's listening to you guys. I was just like, yeah, I was enjoying it. I just wanted to give myself a refresher. It turns out I didn't listen to you guys like three minutes straight, so I listened to it again. So hang on, we have a podcast where not even the hosts are listening to the episode. <laughs> if it's been listening to this and putting fucking a miracle by a Calvin Harris back on, then it's been Calvin all the way up in its class. Calvin Harris is a great producer, though, so that doesn't surprise me that you love it, because I think he is really cool. And I don't, I don't makes really good music. Songs, well, the song that I've everybody didn't... will know, the first thing that everybody remembers him for, the, his kind of breakthrough, was Acceptable in the 80s, in about 2007. It was Acceptable in the 80s, that song. But he's gradually morphed and become more of a versatile producer. He had a song called feels with Pharrell and Katy Perry that was a good song he's done a lot of production work with other people and he has a solid back catalogue of work I've never listened to any of his albums but I have not disliked any of his songs obviously don't listen I've... to the album from last year though Look, <laughs> but all the singles I've heard that there are you know, obviously there are degrees of liking but I've never I've never disliked any of them I would never be annoyed if someone put that on so if you're, if you're a house pie and someone puts Calvin Harris I would never be bummed out but yeah fine yeah, it's pretty good but yeah this one pure nostalgia i'm ready i wish i wasn't intolerant towards eddie golding's voice i did what's wrong has, with it though it just has an effect on me where I, I just hate it 
but even a heyday of the nineties, or all the like the female like no, but... dance songs, they their voices weren't that good. It's exactly the same. They might not have been good, but they had personality. She might as well be an AI, because I and I think an AI would do it better, because I think an AI would at least have some human emotion by accident, whereas the way Ellie Golding sings is completely devoid of anything. I would prefer to listen to the sound of somebody flatline than Ellie Golding. I think she did a fine job. <laughs> <laughs> the song is quite fun, though. It's and fucking good. When I listened to it on the radio, they were calling it... This is where you get the sort of... The different way that English people say the ass out. So they were calling it a trance banger. And I'm like, trance. that's so inconsistent. You either call it a trance banger or a trance bonger. And yeah. that was my biggest takeaway from the song at the time. Trolls bonger. That was our voyage into pop music once again. Some... Or as always, differences and opinions there. And let us know what you think of our opinions on Twitter at Cat Sessions Pod, leave YouTube comments or however you want to contact us. It'll probably be me sat there late at night waiting to listen to your bad takes. And <laughs> on that note, we have another podcast coming out next month. But what are we going to do? I'm not sure how much people would want to listen to it, but we could do an, your favourite unsigned band this one. Like, just bands you've just seen. But I know. don't have any. <laughs> like I would, I'd be like, oh, so yeah, uh, Fallen Voices. <laughs> hey, you In honour of our Swedish listeners, an ABBA special. We can't do another can't. special just after doing the Beatles special. How about we rank the Bond themes? Ooh, yes. So there's only okay. what, how many bundles? Like 20 of them? It's not that much homework. Can... Yeah, there's, oh, there's a few more than that. Do we pick soundtracks or do we pick the one bond? Uh, the bond the, the, the one the that got released theme. as a single, yeah. Oh, it's the Living Daylights of You Kill. The... Golden Eyes are fucking. Diamonds are Forever is pretty good, yeah. too. Yeah. Anyway, this... Nobody oh, yeah. Does It Better by Carly Simon. Oh, yeah. Sang in the style of Alan Partridge. Oh, no, the gold finger so does good. it better. And that'll be a good episode. Stay tuned because next time on the Cacophony Sessions, we'll be doing our favourite Bond themes. Until then, you know what you got to do. It's time for you to sell down in your armchair and stay perpetually funky until I come back on your computer screen. Bye. Bye.